but I do give people tools and things in their little toolbox to help them just to breathe because the whole point of this is not just to do it once a week. It's for us to integrate it into our lives so that when things are happening, we can choose to react differently. Welcome to This Way Up. We are bringing you engaging, informative, and inspiring conversations surrounding all aspects of mental health from the perspective of us as parents and caregivers. I'm Andrea Nanigian. And I'm Emmy Waters. When someone you care about is struggling with their mental health, this can be an incredibly stressful and challenging time. So we're here to provide valuable resources to support you as you navigate this journey. Today, we've got Ashleen Patton, who is a breathwork facilitator, yoga instructor, and somatic therapist in Denver, Colorado. And she shares how intentional breathing and somatic therapy are really positive ways to influence your your mental health. Yep. She's going to get us out of our head and into our body. Ashleen is an intuitive embodiment guide, Reiki energy healer, and a facilitator of holistic breath work in Denver, Colorado. And we're adding to her list a newly trained and certified somatic therapist as well. Using a grounded, heart-centered approach, Ashleen creates an open container for her clients to breathe into their edges, express the unexpressed, and reunite with their wise inner being. Ashleen's mission is to create a safe space for her clients to tap into their innate power of being within their heart, to trust the wisdom of their body, and open themselves up to explore their subconscious. Ashleen, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on here. I can't wait to learn all about these various healing modalities that you are involved with. But to start off, let's begin just talking about breath work. If you could just tell us what the breath work is that you do, how you qualify or describe it. Absolutely. So yeah, so breath work, we can think of as an umbrella term. And so there's many different types of breath work. There's many different lineages. And what I love about breath work is that I feel like it really shows us the untapped potential that we have of something that comes so natural to us, but it can be something that is so profound and so powerful when we use it in a conscious and intentional way. So how I found out about breath work was through my own healing journey. I was highly dysregulated And I didn't even know what that was. I just thought my personality that I just was anxious. And I did put myself in situations of being anxious. I I really didn't like um, when I was fearful of something and to um, kind of challenge that. So there was times where I was afraid of public speaking. So I went and became a tour guide at a whiskey distillery. And so That's phenomenal, not just I, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And so um, I did that for two years and I did it on while I was dysregulated and just didn't know. And so there was an um, incident that I had, a breakup that really just kind of offset it in a way that I was like, I want to... I want to heal. And so I did somatic therapy and she recommended breath work. And so I did breath work and I did this one called holotropic. So breath work, there's many different types. And so the holotropic one, it actually activates the different, the autonomic nervous system that is the sympathetic. So that is the fight or flight. And so it was interesting because I was feeling this buzzing and tingling in my body. And it was probably the most empowering feeling that I felt in quite some time. And once I was doing that one, I heard about another breath work that was now what I'm leading now. And that actually activates the parasympathetic, which anyone in an anxious state, I highly recommend doing nose inhale or the or activating the parasympathetic the reason being is because if you're already in the sympathetic state of the highly alert and anxious to have your nervous system calm down and oscillate to the parasympathetic is absolutely amazing it was the first time that i felt so calm and relaxed and i feel like it shifted 
even my personality. And I was like, wow, I was just anxious the whole time. (laughs) Like this wasn't my personality. This wasn't me. It was just my nervous system being dysregulated for a very long time. Yeah. So the one that I teach is the conscious connective breath work. It's called the sacred breath method. And I studied for a year under the sacred breath Academy. And so it was during the pandemic times. And so I did online, but then there was a time where we did an intensive for nine days and it was an amazing training. I absolutely felt like I got more out of it of just for myself personally. And then it just really helped me step into my leadership and just see how this goes beyond just breath. This is something that um, if we can really tap into it, we can get into different layers of our subconscious and really allow ourselves to get the most clarity that we can get and really truly see ourselves in such a deep way. I loved it because I first started out with one goal and I got something so much more out of it. So I started with just wanting to regulate my nervous system and then it just really allowed me to not only help me, but now my clients really see themselves in such a deeper and different way while regulating their nervous system, while alkalizing their blood, while helping them with their digestion and really helping anxious people to realize that's not them. That is totally just a state that they're in and that they can get out of it once they really learn about their nervous system. Wow. I find that fascinating that different practices of breathing which again, getting back to what you said is something that we just do, you know, just unconsciously, we just breathe, but can activate different parts of your nervous system. And I could see a lot of people, breathing has become so popular these days. It's really become this new thing that people are wanting to learn more about that they may end up getting into a type of breathing that is it that could be counterproductive for them, especially if they're in, you know, struggling with anxiety or depression or something. Yeah, 90% of people actually breathe improperly and they don't even know it. And so um, that can really cause people to be anxious. But also, I really feel that what's important is for people to really trust themselves and feel like if one modality doesn't fit them, it's not one size fits all. And to really understand that. So um, there's certain types of breath work that could be helpful for one person and then not the other. But definitely, if you are an anxious individual or have anxiety, sometimes it's just learning about why you would want to get into the parasympathetic or why you would want to get into doing a breath work that does the sympathetic to really help you to advocate for your own healing while you're on this journey of understanding and learning yourself. So Ashleen, did you say parasympathetic related breathing is better for someone who has anxiety than the the sympathetic style? Yeah. So I would say it really, it's just understanding more about what your, what your goal is. So okay. say an anxious person is trying to just feel more calm and really allow themselves to feel like they can regulate. And so it's really titrating the nervous system and having it oscillate from getting from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic, but not staying there. We never want to stay in the parasympathetic or in the sympathetic. So if you're in the parasympathetic for a long, long period of time, usually that's people in depression. And so if you're in the sympathetic, it's usually people that are stuck in anxiety patterns. So I learned that in my somatic therapy. And so that's why it's really tied it all together is that um, learning different modalities to help people in their end goal. So say someone's end goal is I want to be able to just sleep. I have these anxious thoughts in my head. I'm ruminating and I can't, I just can't get out of it. Yes, I would definitely tell them to get in. I I would guide them into their parasympathetic and help them to really allow them to get back into oscillating from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. And that's what's so beautiful about this breath work is that it helps to breathe in a way that right now we're in the beta brain wave. So as I'm talking, we are... Um, you are analyzing, assessing, judging, even the people listening to this are having their own judgments, own assessments. So we are so focused on the external that it's hard for us to get internal. And so when we're, when I guide people to breathe into this way, I'm their timekeeper. And I'm also 
uh, guiding them through it so that they can get not only from the beta, but their brain waves will slowly slow down and get into the alpha. So they'll feel more into their body. They'll feel the buzzing and tingling just from their own oxygen, which is so cool. You're increasing the oxygen, you're decreasing the carbon dioxide, and it's allowing you to feel your energy in your body because 90% of our energy comes from oxygen. And then eventually you're slowing down the brain waves to get even into the theta and that's the goal. And so about 20 to 25 minutes, you'll be into theta brainwave. And what's so beautiful, beautiful about the theta is that you're in this dream time state. So you're no longer focused on the external and that's what gives people so much clarity while also regulating their nervous system. So they're calming the nervous system, getting into the parasympathetic, the rest digest restored state. And then it's allowing their bodies to feel safe enough to access this brainwave state to allow themselves to be in the state. And so what can happen with that is there can be many different things. Also a fun fact, in our lower lungs, we have DMT and a little bit can be released. It's not like a huge dose. So people can see sacred geometry. They can see, it's also can be spiritual. You can see past loved ones, but also um, it gets into this beautiful realm where you're just getting your higher consciousness and your subconscious is coming through and anything that you're needing to see or experience or witness at that time is going to come through for you. It's, I feel so honored to witness people in it. It's, it's a really cool experience. And you're fully aware while you're, the person doing the breathing exercises is fully aware of what's going on. No, they're not. They're not? No, I did it with Ashley and, and I would say no. Uh, sorry, Ashley, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry, what was the question? As the person doing the breathing exercises and you get into this theta state, which by the way, I, I don't know what DMT is, but I want to understand that too. Yeah. But are you fully aware of what is going on? Like, are you, even though you're tapping into your subconscious, are you consciously aware of what's happening? For the most part, people are consciously aware of what's going on, but they're in such a dream time state that sometimes it's even hard to explain what is going on. It takes a while to integrate because just it's a different, again, it's not like the external that we're in right now. You're in such a lucid state that so much can happen. And I mean, if you want to explain more of, of your experience, I would love to hear more of that as I was guiding you through it, how it felt for you. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I didn't think I was going to talk about this, but oh, you don't have because to. it, it, no, I'm fine talking about it. It's I still to this day have a really hard time putting it into words, Ashleen, because it was, I know some of the things that happened during the session, which by the way, lasted two hours. I would have thought 15 minutes went by. So I had no concept of time. I was regulating a prescribed breathing pattern that Ashleen guides me through. But because two hours went by and I had no idea how that much time had passed. I, to this day, don't understand how I maintained the pace of breath without thinking about maintaining a pace of breath. So that is really, that is a tough one for me to understand. Now, what I actually experienced was, again, if it didn't happen to me and somebody said this, I don't think I would really believe it, but I was definitely in a different place in my brain. I don't know how to explain it. I was, I was there, but I wasn't fully aware of time. I was definitely, I guess, in a dreamlike place. And I was going through a very intense grieving process at the time. So I actually thought I reached out to Ashleen to have what would feel like a massage and have a really good cry. That's what I thought it was going to be like. And it wasn't that. It was this unbelievable release that I had no control over. And I was very self-conscious. So I wasn't really comfortable with like, let it all hang out in front of Ashleen, who I didn't know, but it was a, a tremendous release. And I did have the experience of my loved one who had passed being literally with me. So it was to this day, I can just, I'm so thankful for that. And I, I just can't believe that that's what happened. It was beyond beautiful. And the piece I walked out out the door with is still with me. It never, it just transformed my life. It never went away. Wow. Okay. So do people do this? Emmy did it a little while ago. Do people do this regularly? 
Yeah. So a couple things I want to uh, just point out is that because now I know how to explain it a little bit better just through what Emmy was saying. But so there, when we're breathing in this way, there's a part of our brain called the limbic brain that gets activated and it doesn't know the difference between past, present, and future. So anything can happen as if it's in real time. And what's really amazing is that there's a thing called time dilation. And so it could feel like 15 minutes when we've been breathing for actually like 40 to 45 minutes or to an hour. So it's really beautiful. And it was so amazing to witness you, Emmy. I mean, you did such a beautiful, um, and for our first time. Oh, you could remember that? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's I amazing. remember it like it was yesterday. And it was really beautiful because I could tell that you were nervous when we first did it. And you were like, I yeah. don't know what to expect. <laughs> and so we took a really long time in the beginning just for you to kind of get to know me and be able to ask questions. And the way that I explained it, I just kind of explained it in more. I, I knew that you were very curious, but you wouldn't have done something that you didn't feel like you had full like control or were able to like stop at any time. And so I really wanted to reiterate that. Mm -hmm. And knowing that um, this isn't about me, this is about you and you being able to access these parts of yourself. And some people aren't ready to do that. And there, it's not, it's not for me to decide. And so I always allow people, you know, at any time, if you want to just open up your eyes, look around the room and be like, I'm done. Um, at some points I do tell people like to slow down the breath before they do that. So it's not so jarring. The whole point of this process is for us to regulate the nervous system, not for us to, to create panic. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just loved your process and that you fully, once you were in it, you fully committed and you got something that was so beautiful. I mean, I remember like you leaving me having tears just from being like, wow, that's, that's really special that I, I always feel honored that I get to be a part of someone's really intimate sessions that, that can occur. So, and it's, and I mean, if you want, if I'm being honest, that's not an uncommon thing that, um, at least for my clients, I have many clients that have been through very similar situations that you have, especially through a uh, grieving process. And I think what's so beautiful about breath work is it helps us tap into the emotions that sometimes we're, are just not available on our busy days. And it gives us so much space. And when we're, when we feel like we're in a safe container, it really allows us to allow that, that process of the grieving, because if we can't fully feel grief, we also can't feel joy. So yeah. it really helps us to, to really feel into that. So to answer the question about um, how many times people do this, I have people that have done a three month program with me and every single week they have done a breath work. And it's usually anywhere from the first session is always two hours. I always just leave, like to leave that space and I never want feel, someone to feel incomplete in that. And then we leave it from one and a half hours to two hours after that. And then now I'm doing the somatic therapy. So I'm helping with the integration process with us just like kind of in the next couple of days or that week that I, I do that process with them. And so, um, yeah, I always tell people that we do want to leave time for it, though. It's not something to do every single day, especially this breath work. But I do give people tools and things in their little toolbox to help them just to breathe. Because the whole point of this is not just to do it once a week. It's for us to integrate it into our lives so that when things are happening, we can choose to react differently if say we were usually anxious in times where our mother-in-law or mother came to us and you know they would come to us with the same things we could actually choose differently and react differently and so our patternings would be different and we can we see that we have the power to react in different ways because our nervous system isn't so amped up how did the breath work sessions with you uh, let's say i have anxiety and i do a breath work session with you and then I go home and I'm back in my environment, my normal life. How do the breathwork sessions impact me in my day-to-day -to, -day to help me with my anxiety? How is that actually working? What's happening? Yeah. So I would say when people are in an anxious state, they're in the sympathetic, so the fight or flight. So even just doing a breathwork itself, I mean, there's a psychologist that says, two hours of breath work is associated to about equivalent to two years of psychotherapy. So this is like wow. really impactful work. 
I mean, people can, like you said, it has impacted you, Emmy, to this day. And we did that, what, like a year ago? And yeah. so it's it's really profound because it helps people to access parts of themselves that they haven't, but also it helps them to be in a calmer state so that, yeah, maybe the next time that they come out of the breath work and they go home and they are now in this integration process where it's like the breath work is kind of like inertia. It started something and it's really allowed them to kind of see things and see themselves differently. They're no longer thinking that uh, this anxious person because they have that proof right now that they are calm. So then what it, what it may actually help them do is say they um, get into an anxious state again and they act as they did before. If they go into another breath work and then it gives them another reference for their brain for themselves that wow, like I am calmer, I can be calm. And so maybe the same thing happens to them. And now they react a little bit differently, or they act in more of a calmer way, because their nervous system is no longer triggered in the way that it was before. Because what I'm helping people do is retrain their nervous system to have a different story. (laughs) I retrain their nervous system to be like, you know what, I don't always have to stay in the sympathetic. And because because what happens is if a, if a situation happens, so I see m- my dog all the time. I have a chocolate lab when we're walking and something stresses her out, she will immediately shake. And then she's this happy, she's smiling. She, my dog smiles all the time and she's just back to her, her cute little self. And so we don't have those situations. We don't have those opportunities or we don't allow ourselves to have those opportunities. So we stuck in store trauma in our cellular memory and in our tissues. So what I'm helping people do is to release those traumatic situations through either a catharsis release or certain purges. It could even be as simple as a yawn. People wouldn't know, but a yawn is actually a purge um, or even coughing. And so it's a way that our system tells us in our bodies, tells us these little subtleties of even just a tear of release, that that is actually releasing things um, especially in a breath work or in a somatic therapy, that it's it's allowing our bodies to release things that we've been stuck in storing. I've had people that have had a breath work and they've been trembling, and that's actually trauma being released in the body. Um, so it can be as severe as that. You know, curating these valuable conversations is really about our shared passion for promoting mental wellness. Behind the scenes, however, There are several platforms and systems that help us bring these episodes to you. If you found value in our conversations and feel inspired to support, please consider making a donation. Whether it's the price of coffee or wine or more, your contribution directly supports our ability to keep connecting, sharing, and growing with you. Please visit our website at thiswayuppodcast.com to support this community. We thank you and we appreciate you. I'm hearing all of this and I'm thinking about how as an adult, it can be so freeing, but then I'm also now relaying it back with my parent hat on and thinking, gosh, if I could teach this to my youngins early on, might be preventative for them to be storing all of that stuff and be able to better manage themselves moving forward. Is this something you teach to kids or kids can learn? Yeah. That's a great question. So I would say the type of breath work, uh, the prolonged one, I wouldn't do with the kids. First, they don't have that attention span. Sure. And then right. also because it changes brainwave states and any kid that is the way that their brain is developed. I mean, they don't have before even seven, their prefrontal cortex isn't really fully developed. So I personally, I haven't done enough research to really know that. So I don't, I don't take on any clients that are, they have to be 18 or older um, is usually what I, but I still do. I mean, I do yoga and a little bit of breath work, uh, just even like breathe, like being intentional with the breathing with kids. And I used, I used to be a nanny and I did this all the time and it really helped them to be more aware. And so absolutely, I think this is a great thing to teach kids or even just tell them to shake it out or like, you know, like it's okay. Be, you know, like when they're, when they are angry, instead of suppressing that, like allowing them to, to be able to express it because 
emotions are just energy in motion. They just need somewhere to go. So if we don't allow that, I mean, I remember when I was younger, I was told that I was too sensitive and that I was a crybaby and I cried too much. So now I went through a process of healing that within myself and being like, oh, actually, my emotions are beautiful. My sensitivity and vulnerability is the reason why my clients and friends and loved ones feel safe around me because they know that they don't have to put on a a fake face. They can actually be who they truly are. And so I had to change that story around that. I think the biggest thing that I would love for kids to know is that their emotions aren't who they are, but it's allowed to be expressed and that and learning how to breathe and calm them and calm the nervous system once they got it all out, I think is a really beautiful process that we we can all help children to really understand and come to strengthen their ability to trust themselves and also like trust that what they're feeling is valid <laughs> and that we don't yeah. have to shy it or push it away. You know, I think that, Emmy, I think that's been the big shift in narrative over the past few years, don't you think? Like when we were younger, it was you suppr- buck it up, suppress your your feelings, rub now, dirt on it. <laughs> yeah. Now it may still be you need to buck it up, but go ahead and feel first. Yeah. And then move forward. And I think that is such a valuable lesson to all of us and something I wish I could even go back and have reiterated to my children when they were younger. To express what they're feeling. To express what they're feeling. It's okay to have those feelings work through them because eventually, mm-hmm. you know, we we work through them and then they go, you know, we learn how to manage them better. But as a child, you know, I don't know what I told them, but I'm sure I was like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's go do this and we'll be happy again, you know, whatever. But it's like, okay, it's fine. You know, go ahead and have those emotions and then let's move forward. And yeah, um, because they, if they don't, they suppress it. Yeah. Especially actually, Andrea, that, that makes a lot of sense too, when we're talking about our kids that even have anxiety too. Those are a lot of times when they're showing early signs of that, that we're immediately trying to fix it. Fix it. And we're yeah. not just allowing everything to come through without interruption. Yeah. Earlier, Ashley, you made a comment about most people are breathing improperly. What would improper breathing look like? So a lot of people are mouth breathers. It's really interesting our bodies are so fascinating that when it's just like any other, like doing yoga or strength training, you're building muscle. So when you stop breathing in through your nose, the body is like, okay, they don't see use in it. And what will happen is you can actually have atrophy in your nasal cavity. So that's why some people have to get surgeries and open the airways because they have been breathing through their mouths. They've seen an even um, Breath by James Nestor is an incredible book and it talks about the, yeah, and it talks about um, the evolution, how sometimes evolution, it's not always beneficial to, to us. We've actually been, we've actually evolved in ways that isn't beneficial. One of them is um, not breathing properly and breathing in the way that that is sustainable for our health and, and beneficial for us. Mm-hmm. Did you read it, Andrea? You read that, didn't you? You know, after re- I was going to say, after reading that, I went to the gym and I was just like, okay, I am going to breathe through my nose. I am doing this. <laughs> I did one lap around the building trying to just breathe through my nose. I thought I was going to pass yeah. out. I was like, this is hard. Yeah. It is. I didn't realize how much. I mean, I think I breathe through my nose. I've got a big enough nose, so I know that the navel passages are open for you know all of that <laughs> airway, but. But but actually trying to do it when you're in a state where you're breathing heavy is is very difficult. It is yeah. very difficult. And a lot of our exercise is meant to push, 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 go as, yeah. fast, as hard as you can. So yeah, you do lose your breath. One thing that I like about our yoga, actually, Ashley, and you, you know this too, but um, in our yoga, we're always cueing for breathing, right? And I'm often, when I'm leading a class, I'm often reminding people that, this yoga is not about push, push, push. It's not about give it your all. It's really about focusing on that slow pace of breathing. And when you feel like you lose that slow pace of breathing because you got too hot or you're just exhausted in a pose or whatnot, your cue is to come back to that slow breath. So I would always, I love to preach to people and say that the yoga does kind of change your response to hardship, to discomfort and to challenge, because now you train yourself 
whether it's in your brain where you start having like monkey mind or you do lose your breath, you then train yourself to come back to that slow breathing. So you're learning an alternate response. Wouldn't you say, Ashleen? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. It's so amazing that way. It is. It's it's so helpful. And what's interesting is um tonight is gonna be my first time that I teach at a it's a it's a hit workout place. So high intensity interval training. So they're used to pushing, go, go, go. So I'm doing a restorative flow for them. So I think it's gonna be really challenging for them and interesting how it will how I will cue them to slow down and do more long restorative poses. And I know it's going to be really challenging because they are used to the go, go, go and just to help them to breathe. But that's what I love about the yoga practices or just the yoga that I have done because that's exactly what it does. It helps me to get into the mind-body connection and allow me to breathe in ways that I'm like, oh, wow, I haven't thought about my breath this entire, like this entire day before I went into this 60 minute class. It's incredible. Yeah. I think there needs to be a balance of both. I will tell you, yoga is one of the most frustrating things for me. I get in there and I'm like, oh my gosh, how much longer do I have to breathe and not think about anything else? But I also know that I really, I think I need to take like a, maybe a seven minute yoga class and then move to a 12 minute yoga class. Maybe that would be the way I would do it. So. Well, and all the yogas are so different too. So there's that, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Ashleen, can you speak and um, teach us a little bit about somatic therapy? Absolutely. Yeah. So what I love is that it really helps us to understand that if we were to talk our way into a solution, we probably would have already done it already. And that if we were able to really talk things out in a way that it solved all of our problems, wow, I would have solved so many problems at this point. But Um, What it really does help is that there is an important piece for talk therapy and to talk things out. Like I'm actually, I process my emotions by talking it through. I'm very analytical. So when I talk about something and I'm crying, I'm like, wow, okay, I I was, I really felt this is how I feel. Um, So I think there's, there's an importance to it. I think our mind really, the, what it's trying to do is of course, help us to survive. It also makes meaning out of things and makes stories. And sometimes those stories and meanings aren't necessarily true. Oh, the stories. Yeah. (laughs) That trips us up. (laughs) Right. And so um, what I love about uh, somatic therapy, especially what I'm, what I'm learning and in my, um, in the training that I've learned is that there's different channels in order for us to really understand ourselves and what we went through, um, especially trauma and like really the things that we told ourselves about ourselves when we went through those certain experiences. So what I love is that it gets us not only from the mind. So there's five different channels and there's the mind channel, there's the imagination, and there is the postures that you can help people to get into, to really feel what they're feeling. If they're so in their head, they're like, well, what would that, what would that posture like? angry, like what would that feel like for you if you could get into that posture? Or even before that, getting them into the imagination. So being like, can you, so say someone is just like, I'm talking and I'm going like this, and you're just like seeing me tap my foot or my hand, you would, and I'm just talking like this, maybe you wouldn't take note of it, but that as a facilitator, I would see that and I'd be like, oh, is there is there someone you somewhere you want to run to? Because what I would see that as a flight response. And so I would see that as like their body's telling me something that they're not telling me. And so they're like, oh, actually, yes, I do feel flighty right now. And I feel like I want to run. You're like, oh, can you imagine yourself running somewhere? And so you really help them to kind of uh, actually uh, complete the process of the flight and not trying to det- deter them away from it. So that's what I love about somatic therapy is it's really helping to complete the response that someone is in. So say if they're in flight, I'm talking about flight, fight, or freeze. So freeze is actually when they can be in the parasympathetic and just stuck there and they're talking very like slow and very, they're almost losing their thoughts. Someone could be in a freeze pattern. So you really help them 
to navigate that and to actually help them be aware of it, complete the process in these different channels. Yeah, so I said the mind, the imagination, the posture, sensations, and then emotions. And what's beautiful is that eventually you will see them get into um, what we call a purge. So it's either they'll have a deep, like um, just spontaneous exhale or sigh. And you're like, wow. And you just make them note that that's really good. Like I saw that you sighed. And um, or they'll have this beautiful uh, release or a cry, or they'll feel like a tremble in their jaw. And that's actually another release response. Um, there's many others, but that's just something, even burping can be a purge that happens. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things with this, I want to take us back just a little bit. First of all, I want to say that trauma doesn't need to be major trauma, right? It can be anything that is perceived as trauma in your life. And it could be my, micro traumas that, are, that, that go on that. Ashleen, can you, somatic therapy is what? If you were just going to explain what it is for somebody who doesn't understand, um, even like myself, what it is, can you just share shortly what it is? Yeah. So soma means the body. And so somatic therapy is relating to the body and really allowing the body to help to process certain emotions or stored emotions or the little or big traumas. I'm sorry that I didn't explain that before, but no, yeah. No, no, that's okay. So you help people then identify what those traumas are and then how it relates to them physically or to their body. Right. I think what it does is um, it helps people to access the deeper meanings to it. So I think when people... Um, they come and they're like, oh, I got in a, in a fight with my boyfriend. Um, they're thinking that that's what we're going to talk about. But then as you go into it, you help them to slow down and be like, how did that make you feel? And so you really get into like the root of what is going on in their body. Um, what's really beautiful is that Peter Levine is um, the one that is like, um, he's like the godfather of like somatic therapy. And it's awesome because he actually credits it to plant medicine, ayahuasca. And so he was saying that um, somatic therapy and and plant medicine go, pair and go really well together. And that's actually the ayahuasca ha- was the one that showed him about somatic therapy. And so, oh. um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And so my teacher, Kyra Maestro, she really helped to for me to see that it's really about us getting out of the mind because our, we try to analyze and make sense of everything but that really gets us in the way of of really finding a way that we don't have to make a story out of it and we can really feel it i think it takes us away from not being able to feel what we're truly feeling in this moment at this time and that's what somatic therapy does is it makes sense it like makes what's happening now not only relatable but acceptable and it makes it so that it's like what you're feeling is valid and true it's making what's here and what's living like able to be expressed so that it's not stored and stuck in the body anymore. Yeah. Earlier when we were talking about breath work, we talked about an individual potentially with anxiety. So using that same type of a client, can you walk us through how a somatic therapy session could potentially help somebody with anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. So I would first orient them and I would just have them, I would just say like, what is, what is your goal for this session? And as they're talking, can kind of see certain things that are showing up for them in their body Mm -hmm. um, and say they're like talking, then they go into a thing that has happened to them recently. And so they're talking and if someone is an anxiety pattern at that time or anxious they might have a fight or flight response. So say they're like going like this as they're talking, they have no idea that they're doing this. They're just kind of like talking, but in that, I would make it aware of what they're doing, but I wouldn't stop them. They would want to stop probably at first and be like, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. And you'd be like, no, what would it feel like if you continue to go slower and let yourself actually feel into that? And so what it helps them do is it helps them to actually be more aware the body is showing them that they're probably in a fight because that's going towards the like 
in fight, you see it as going towards the thing and uh, flight is going away from. So when people are like tapping and they're like tapping their foot or something, you're seeing them as like they're wanting or they're looking at the exit sign. It can be as subtle as that. And you just ask them questions to see to get more in alignment of like, what is here that's making them anxious? And so what's cool is you help them complete that. And then a purge happens and they feel so much better and lighter and they completely don't feel that anxiousness anymore. For anyone who can't see Ashleen, the example she's sharing is when somebody might subconsciously run their hands through their hair and it would, might look like a nervous behavior, but so I just wanted to point that out because a lot of us are just going to be listening through and not seeing your your movements. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Or like tapping your foot or something. Sorry. So Ashleen, you said that you got into breath work because you were doing um, the somatic therapy. Yeah. Are these two um, practices typically something that people do in conjunction with one another? Or do they start with somatic and then move into breath work to help control once they've already healed some of the the traumas that they've gone through? Yeah, I would always say it's an individual, um, it's an individual thing in their goal, but um, they go really well together. So I would say it's something that definitely pairs really well. But some, I would say some people like the breath work, and then other people can get into the the somatic sometimes when people are way too into their head um, and analytical it does take some time to get them into even imagining something or get them out of out of that state. I'm planning to do in a program to get people to do the breath work, but also part of their integration after that in the next couple of days, just whatever comes up for them. We do the somatic practices to really help them to integrate what has been coming up for them. Gosh, I really want to try that. Have you ever done anything like that, Andrea? No, no, not at all. Oh, I'm open to doing it to both of you. That's all be right. Great. <laughs> Let's do it. Does Andrea have to come to Colorado to do that? No, not at all. I do it online, <laughs> and awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I actually have a client in Seattle, Washington, and oh, she, nice. yeah, and she's done about like five sessions. So it's been uh, or four sessions now, and it's been really awesome to um, see her do it. She first did breath work. And then she actually had someone that said she would somatic, something about somatic therapy. And she's like, I've been wanting to try it. I'm like, well, <laughs> I am doing this training. <laughs> so interesting. I want to do the breath work. I didn't realize I could do it um, online. So we're going to have to make sure in the, in the show notes, we're going to put your information down because I also am thinking of several people, names not to be included in this, who might be, benefit from this. And I'm glad to know you could do it online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do it online and in person. And I have my in person is in Cherry Creek, Denver, in Denver, Colorado, in the Cherry Creek area. Emmy, you know, we talk about perspective yeah. so much. And you mentioned, Ashleen, the imagination and the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that kids tell themselves of how they perceive a situation just messes with us long term. I've never really put it into perspective of imagination, but that's exactly what it is. It's the imagination. Oh, absolutely. And we're always working a narrative. Always. We need to be teaching our kids how to shape that narrative positively. Yeah. We need to remind ourselves and our people that one, we need to recognize what that narrative is. And two, know that we have full editing rights over that narrative. You can shift it, change it at any time once you have the perspective. So, um, Ashleen, if somebody were to try to find you, we're going to provide all that information. But outside of that, what are some of the keywords that somebody should search? How do they find appropriate breathwork close to them if they're looking for in-person? What are we actually looking for? Because breathwork is such a, a buzzword out there. It could be all, yeah, it could be all different things. Yeah, I would say someone who is trauma-informed. And I personally, conscious connective breath work is what I guide. And so it's just making sure that they ask the question of what type of breath work is this? Is this a mouth inhale or nose inhale? So that they're aware of which one that they're going to be the autonomic nervous system that they're going to be activating. So again, the mouth breath works or the mouth inhales is going to be the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight. 
And then the nose inhale is the parasympathetic, which is the rest I just restored state. And so just looking out for that and looking for just really trying it out, I feel the best way to do something is to try it out and see it for yourself and being open enough, but knowing that it might not be for you and that's okay. Yeah. And it's different for everyone. You've said that before. It's always a different experience too. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, they can always connect with me. Even if I'm not in their area, I'd be happy to guide them through that. And if I can help them in any way. And my Instagram is heart led prana. And yeah, that's one way to get in touch with me. Also, my website is heartledprana.com. can do a consultation call there as well, just to get more information. Thanks for sharing that. And I will say, not only are you um, a very skilled facilitator of these different healing modalities, you are undeniably very gifted on an intuitive level too. So I think that that's a really nice blend in the healing space um, that you create and the the work that you really are doing for people. So thank you for putting good out there and all that you do. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate that. Ashleen, you need to use that as a testimonial on your website. That was great. Thank you for tuning in to today's conversation. To join our community and access more valuable resources, please visit our website at thiswayuppodcast.com. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this with a friend. And to stay connected, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Listen to This Way Up. Listen to This Way Up.